we are ready to start with another layer in the sanctuary and I'm going to show you how this layer of the sanctuary is giving us prophetic insight. So let us pray. Father, we thank you that we can move through these layers and see the depth of the message that is within the sanctuary. I pray, Father, for wisdom through your Holy Spirit now, in Jesus' name. Amen. I am going to share in the last lecture that the sanctuary is a system of truth. Now, when I say a system of truth, when I was studying at University of Porch, I had a subject called um, um, thermodynamics. All right? That's a heat and cold and things like that. It's a difficult subject, but uh, I enjoyed it to a certain extent. It was not my type of subject, but I enjoyed it. And we talked about the closed system. All right? Now, what I mean by a closed system is, is that nothing is added or nothing is subtracted from that system. So if you keep that system as it is, it will never change. doesn't matter if it's 20 years or 50 years or whatever it may be, if nothing was changing in there. So God's Word is like a closed system, not a closed book. It's a closed system. That means that everything we need is contained in that book. We just have to look for them. And through all my studies, that is what I've seen. The answers are there, but we are too lazy. To study God's word the way we should. All the answers are found in that. So we're going to look at the doctrines of the church. How it relates to the sanctuary. And that it's all found in the sanctuary. And I want to say straight like I'm going to say then. If we believe a doctrine or something that is not in the sanctuary. I don't want to believe it. I'm so bold of saying that to you. Because after my study with the sanctuary. I realized that everything is there. God has given us everything, this system of truth. And prophecy is also there. And that is what I'm going to show you in this lecture and the next one to come. So, the one we're starting with is the feast days. That you know that the feast days actually is prophetic. There's a verse in Psalm 68 verse 24. It says, They have seen thy goings, O God. Even the goings of my God, my King, in the sanctuary. What does that mean? That means we see God moving. We see where He's going. That's what it means. In the sanctuary. Now, where's God going? Is it just that like He's walking around the throne in the universe somewhere? All right. There's salvation history. And God is moving in salvation history to finish the plan of salvation to finish the plan of the covenant right and we can follow him by faith by looking at the sanctuary and this lecture will be on the feasts and then we go to the book of daniel and revelation but i i have mentioned it in the previous lecture when we are looking at god's goings in the sanctuary prophetically we cannot just look at the sanctuary building because what is attached to the sanctuary building is the Jewish economy. The word Jewish economy is from the spirit of prophecy. She, she uses the word Jewish economy. Now what is included in the Jewish economy is a few things. Is the sanctuary was the main part or the center of the Jewish worship. And the symbolism that pointed to Jesus and salvation. But with that comes other things like the seven feasts. So in the whole year, for a Jewish person, right, in the Jewish year, there were feast days which they had to go and attend, which also spoke about salvation, right? But it was more than just salvation. It was also prophetic. It was also prophetic. Then there was the sabbatical, right, the sabbatical rest, right, and the debts that were canceled on the seventh year, and the land rested. Did you know that that is also prophetic? We as seven natives, we believe 6,000 years on this planet, and there's going to be a 7,000 year. All right. That's prophetic. Okay. The Jubilee is prophetic. All right. The Jubilee we will experience when the, the original property is given back to us. Because Satan took it from us. All right. Jesus died on the cross, not just for human beings, but for the property. 
Did you know that? Jesus died for every single human being to be saved and the property to be given back to the original owners. We will receive our property in heaven. That's what the Jubilee is all about. The Kingsman Redeemer could buy back the property. Talks about Jesus and his, the whole plan of salvation to buy back that property if we have lost it. Then we have the cities of refuge. All right, I'm going to speak a little bit on the cities of refuge as well. In Jesus as the city of refuge. And then the laws that govern the lives, especially ceremonial laws that govern the lives of the Israelites. Everything contributes to the prophetic vision. The sanctuary as the center of the worship in the whole Jewish economy also has a prophetic significance. There's a text that I've given you just now. We can see God's goings in the sanctuary. The different phases of ministry in the sanctuary and the earthly feast days act like a calendar pointing to the time when the antitype will come. Since all these things are a shadow of things to come. Therefore, we cannot separate the study of prophecy and the message of the sanctuary. We understand prophecy when we look through the lens of the sanctuary. Through the lens of the sanctuary and the Jewish economy. In this text in Leviticus 23 verse 4, where all the feast days are described, the seven feasts are described, we read this text in the beginning. It says, these are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. Very specific. Did you know that the, the word for feasts in the Hebrew and the word used for seasons is the same word? And going further than that, the word for feast and season in that book is the same word, mohed, and it also means appointed times. Appointed times. <clears throat> if you read the book of Daniel, you speak about the appointed time. All right? And that's called prophetic. That's called prophetic. So these feasts are by God designed to be prophetic in their time. Okay, as prophetic times. <clears throat> These types, now if you read Great Controversy, when the, the Advent movement, William Miller, Alan White and them, that were studying the scriptures, saying that Jesus will come, and then the great disappointment, how did they calculate 22 October 1844? How did they calculate it? They looked at the feasts. They looked at the Day of Atonement. There was a guy with the name of Samuel Snow, one of our pioneers. They were right at close to the time of 1844. And they were preaching. And, and 1843 went. Jesus didn't come. But, but William Miller didn't want to set times. He didn't want to set times. And one day they were busy with meetings and, and Samuel Snow came. And he says, I received the revelation from, from the Bible. And he was correct. See the revelation. He says, listen, we need to look at the atonement, the day of atonement. And it's going to happen this year, in 1844, on 22 October. And the Advent believers embrace that message. Because they want Jesus to come. Unfortunately, it was a time setting, thinking Jesus will come. But it was the correct time for the judgment to start. All right. So they looked at these feast days. And they realized that if they start with the first feast, the Passover, hey, wait a second, Jesus died on that Friday, Passover, the Passover lamb was slaughtered on the very same day, 14th of the first month of a Jewish year, Jesus died. Then all the others followed. The next day started the feast of the unleavened bread. And then the third day was the wave sheaf. 50 days later, was the Pentecost. Uh, and so they, everything happened exactly on the same date. That they kept the feast all these years. And when the antitype came, wait a second, everything happened. Jesus, everything followed on the time period as well. As pointed out by the feasts. The appointed time. So they are carrying on say, Alan White says, arguments drawn from the Old Testament types also pointed to the autumn 
as the time when the events represented by the cleansing of the sanctuary must take place. This was made very clear as attention was given to the manner in which the types relating to the first advent was fulfilled. So they are reasoning. They are what we call the spring feasts, and then there's a gap, and then there's the autumn feasts. Right? The spring feasts, there were three of them, and then, oh, sorry, four of them, and then at the autumn feast, there are three of them. So they're reasoning, well, if these ones happen at the same time, why not the autumn feasts? And we can determine when Jesus will come. But of course, it was not the second coming because we don't know the date of the second coming. It was the judgment, the day of atonement. On the very day that the feasts were kept all these years, the days, all the days of atonement that were kept on that date. So that was their reasoning. So now, I guess you have a lot of questions already. I hope it will be answered when we're done. So there were seven feasts. Four of them are called the spring feasts. Were held in the beginning of the Jewish uh, religious year. The first month. And when was that instituted? When they went out of Egypt. Remember that? The Passover was kept the 14th day of the first month. And the blood was put on the, door, put on the doorposts. And they left Egypt. Okay? And they had to eat bread. Unleavened bread. And so forth. So that was instituted right in the beginning there. And then follow the four feasts till Pentecost. The spring feasts. And then there was a gap. And then we had the autumn feasts. Alright. In a Jewish year, in a Jewish mind, that is, that is also connected to a wedding festival. I think last time when I was here at Clarksdorp Church, I did with you the Jewish wedding. If you can still remember. The four feasts are talking about the engagement of the couple. What would happen during the engagement of the man and the lady? Jesus and his church. So the Passover, the unleavened bread, wave sheaf, and Pentecost tells us about the engagement with Jesus and his church. Then Jesus says, I have to go away. I have to go away. And I will come back. So there's a gap. There's a gap. And then the last feast tells us, Jesus is on his way back. Does it make sense? That is happening in a Jewish wedding. So the last feast, the autumn feasts are connected to Jesus' second coming. The first feast to Jesus' first coming. Right, let's go to them. Sorry, I just wanted to read something here. I think you can read it yourself. It's just talking about the first feast there. And there were only, there was three feasts from the seven that the males had to attend them, right? That was the Passover, it was Pentecost, and Tabernacles, the Feast of Tabernacles. The males had to come and um, attend the feasts. So there are the feasts, the Passover, the Unleavened Bread, the Wave Sheaf, Pentecost, Trumpets, Day of Atonement, Tabernacles. Let's go through all of them in detail. There were seven Sabbaths connected to these feasts um, during the during um, the Passover and the unleavened bread, there were two feasts, or two Sabbaths, okay? One in the beginning of unleavened bread, one at the end of unleavened bread. And then the third Sabbath was during Pentecost. That was the day of, it was also a Sabbath day. And then the Feast of Trumpets was a Sabbath day. The Day of Atonement was a Sabbath day. And two Sabbath days in the beginning of the end of the Feast of Tabernacles. So just look at the symbols I'm using. I'm using it as I'm describing here. Passover. It was held on the 14th day. The 14th day of the new moon of the first month of Nisan or Abib. Um, and usually towards the evening, the late afternoon. That was when the, when the Passover lamb was slain. Right? was towards the afternoon, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. On the 14th day of the first month. The priest offered a year-old lamb without blemish. Um, the new moon of Nisan indicated the beginning of the religious year of the Jews. It was commemorative of the deliverance from Egypt because that's where it started. It's typical, means the death of Jesus. Jesus is that lamb. We'll see it there. 
all males required to attend, and only one sacrifice was offered as the Passover. So it tells us about the death of Jesus, the Passover, that day. We find it from Scripture, the 1 Corinthians 5, 7, for even Christ, our Passover, is uh, sacrificed for us. So Jesus is that Passover. So as I'm going through the feasts, I'm going to put it on the screen on the sanctuary. So the Passover is the cross. All right? Let's go to unleavened bread. It was held on the 15th day. That was the day just after Passover. So the next day started the, the feast of unleavened bread for seven days. Till the 21st of the month of Nisan. It was held in the beginning of the barley harvest. So they could not harvest the barley before the wave sheave was given. Well, I'll talk about the wave sheave just now. All right. But it was the beginning of the barley harvest. Everyone had to remove leaven from their houses. All right. That was even done before Passover. Commemorative of the exodus in haste from Egypt and the hardship in the wilderness. So the Passover, unleavened bread, and the wave sheave was combined. And it was complete eight days. Even the, the Passover connected to the, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread was then complete eight days. But the Feast of Unleavened Bread was only seven days. Sometimes, sometimes the Jews referred to the Passover as the whole thing. Right? They would just say the Passover. But it included Unleavened Bread and the Wave Sheaf. It's typical of the sinless life of Christ. Right? The Bread of Life. Um, the first and the last days were feast Sabbaths, and seven sacrifices were offered during this day. It t- typified Jesus' life and death, of course, uh, being in the grave, not his death in being in the grave. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 8, and Hebrews 5, verse 4, verse 15. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Right, so that leaven represents the wickedness. So they had to put away the, the malice of, of, of wickedness. That was the leaven. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like us, yet without sin. That is what the feast of unleavened bread meant. Right. And that we find the death of Jesus He's laying in the grave and his resurrection. Not resurrection, sorry. The resurrection comes just after. It says in the grave. That's the, the um, symbol there. The wave sheaf happened in the Feast of First Fruits. That is the 16th day. That means the third day from Passover. 14, 15, 16. That was that Sunday morning. All right. If it fell on a Sunday, that held on the 16th day of the first month of Nisan. The first fruits of the barley harvest was waved before the Lord, and then the harvest started. Typical of Jesus' resurrection as the first fruits from the dead, and when he rose, he brought other first fruits with him from the grave. Only one sacrifice offered. Very significant. When Jesus came out of the grave, he's the first fruits. He's that barley, but there's other first fruits as well that came out of the grave at Jesus' death. You know about that? Okay, they were also taken as first fruits to heaven when Jesus ascended to heaven after 40 days. Those are the first fruits. So the barley, the first harvest of the barley, represented those first fruits. So that's the resurrection of Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 15, 23, Christ, the first fruits, after they that are Christ at his coming. So Jesus is our first fruits. Right, that's the resurrection of Christ. And then, of course, we know there's ascension to heaven. So that happens, of course, here on earth. It happened on earth. So the cross, which is the Passover, the, the grave, the unleavened bread, the resurrection, the wave sheaf. Let's go to Pentecost. Let's go to Pentecost. I'm going fast through these because I want to get to the end and explain a little bit more. These things you can read yourself. All right, when I give you the notes. But Pentecost happened 50 days after the wave sheaf. Remember, the feast days could fall on any day of the week. Okay? It could be a Tuesday. It could be a Wednesday. 
right, as the Jewish year is going. But when Jesus was crucified, the feast days fell on, on this Friday, and then the Saturday and the Sunday was the wave sheaf. Exactly on the days when Jesus was crucified and resurrected. All right. It came together exactly as it was foretold. It was called the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Harvests. It was held on the 50th day after the wave sheaf. That is significant when Jesus uh, arose from the, from the dead. He went to his father the same day. He said to Mary, don't touch me. I have not seen my father. He goes up to his father to the throne. His sacrifice is accepted. He comes back the same day and appears to the disciples. Then he spent the 40 days. All right. And those who were resurrected from the grave spent 40 days witnessing. And then Jesus ascended to heaven. Right after 40 days. And then there's 10 days left to make it to Pentecost. And during these 10 days, the disciples were in the upper room. Praying and uniting together. You know, confessing their sins. And Jesus promised to give them the Holy Spirit. Exactly on the 50th day, the Holy Spirit was poured out on Pentecost. It was, sorry, a wave offering of grain in the form of two Unleavened, two leavened breads. It's not unleavened breads. This time it's leavened bread. Two leavened breads. Why? Why not unleavened? Why not unleavened? Because the verse promised that there will be other first fruits. Jesus is the first fruit out of the grave. Then come the others that were um, out of the grave. And then comes Pentecost. And when Peter preached at Pentecost, who were saved? Jews and Gentiles. Right, so these breads, the Jews and Gentiles, but they leavened. Right, there's not the representation of Christ. It's the work of what Jesus is doing through his death and resurrection. But it was the result of what was done as the two breads are waved before God. All right. Celebrated the season or beginning of the wheat harvest. Now the wheat harvest comes. And when it was finished, the wheat harvest started. Typical of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And the inauguration of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary to start his ministry in the holy place. That was the sign. When Jesus poured out the Holy Spirit on his disciples, they knew that Jesus' work started in the heavenly sanctuary. The bread typified also first fruits of a greater harvest of Jews and Gentiles until the end of time because of the life of Jesus. Um, this day also pointed back to Mount Sinai when God renewed the covenant with Israel and on, uh, to give them the Torah and 50 days after 50 days of crossing the Red Sea. I want you to notice this relationship here. As Israel departed from Egypt, Paul makes very interesting remarks. He says the whole nation of Israel was baptized in the Red Sea. Did you read it? The book of Corinthians. Baptized in the Red Sea. Okay? Now that baptism is the water labor, right? Okay? And I'm going to show you that in the one of the next lectures on the salvation issue. So they go through baptism and the resurrection. Okay? That's the wave sheaf, right? That's what when the wave sheaf happened. 50 days later, exactly 50 days later, Sinai. And the law was given on Sinai. So the Jews connected Pentecost with what happened on Sinai. All right, so we go further on. It was a feast Sabbath. All males were to, required to attend, and 13 sacrifices were offered. So the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, sorry, here's the text. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. That was the promise of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. So that happened when Jesus ascended to heaven. His inauguration in heaven, he poured out the Holy Spirit upon his disciples. Let's take the next one. Now we are finished with the spring feasts. All right? Now we go to the autumn feast. And remember the autumn feasts are related to the second coming of Jesus. 
The first feasts are related to Jesus' first coming. The trumpets were held on the first day of the tenth month. Ah, oh, sorry, first day of the seventh month. Um, and it was called Rosh Hashanah. The new moon of Tishri, when the new moon came, right? They usually with the new moon, that's how they calculated their months. And I want to make this, while I'm thinking about it, um, remember the lady, the pure lady in the book of Revelation? She stands on the moon. Remember that? She has the sun shining out of her. She shines bright as the sun. But her feet was on the moon. This is where it comes from. Because the Jewish economy, the old Jewish economy, was related by the moon. All right, the months of that. So she's standing on the moon. She's standing on the Jewish system. All right, the ceremonial system. So this woman, right, the church, she has the righteousness of Jesus. And where does she stand on? Where's her foundation? At the sanctuary. That is describing God's remnant church. The remnant church of God has the righteousness of Jesus and they stand on the sanctuary system. They understand that the sanctuary system points to Jesus and everything Jesus is doing. And that's where they build their pillars of their faith. On that message. The new moon of Tishri indicated the beginning of the Jewish civil new year. So the Jews had two calendars. They had the religious calendar which God put into place where the feast days would start in the first month up to the end. But then they had a civil year starting in the seventh month. All right. So it, it's a bit confusing, but the Jews knew what they were doing anyway. So we don't have to live in that system. Two silver trumpets and the shofar was blown on the Feast of Trumpets. That was um, to warn them now, because in 10 days, the Day of Atonement is going to start. They need to get ready. So it's typical of the Advent message proclaimed before 1844, the first angel's message together with the signs of sun, moon, stars, and earthquake. That comes from Revelation chapter 6, right, on the sixth seal, where the sixth seal is open. And there was a great earthquake. The sun and moon had a, had a sign. And the stars fell from heaven. The last one in 1833. You remember that? Okay. So the, the proclaiming of the Advent message was intensified. And 10 days before, I believe 10 days before, 22 October, it was really the trumpet was blowing. But we can see the whole Advent movement. We can see the trumpets are blowing. Warning people that the day is there. But especially first days before, before uh, the Day of Atonement happened. It was a feast Sabbath. There was one sacrifice given there. So that's the Advent movement. We find the Advent movement, Revelation 14.7. The hour of His judgment has come. They proclaimed the hour of His judgment without knowing that is the hour of His judgment. They thought it was the second coming. But they were faithful in proclaiming the hour of his judgment, even though they had the wrong event. And at midnight, there was a cry. Behold, the bridegroom comes. Go you out to meet him. That is applying to the Advent believers. In those ten days, they say, go out and meet the bridegroom. He is coming. Right, those ten days. The sign is sounding the trumpet that the day of atonement is coming. They gave the midnight cry. We give the loud cry. It's still coming. We are busy giving the loud cry. And last one, and the seven angels with the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. In the book of Revelation, there are seven trumpets. So those trumpets were blowing in the book of Revelation, warning the world that there's a day of atonement coming. We'll see that when we get to the book of Revelation. So, that was the second Advent movement that is warning the world that Jesus is going into the most holy place for judgment. Right, so it's given there just before the judgment starts. And then, of course, arrived the Day of Atonement on 22 October. 
That is the 10th day of the month of Tishri. It was the most solemn day in the Jewish calendar. And the high priest went into the most holy place to cleanse the sanctuary. The Israelites had to afflict their souls, fast, pray, gather around the sanctuary, and keep the day as a holy feast day. That is very important for us to understand as Seventh-day Adventists. That is what our work is while Jesus is in the heavenly sanctuary. Prayer, searching our souls, fasting. But how can you fast from 1844? It's called the health message. It's called a simple lifestyle. That's what it's called. Let me just speak to you straightforward. Let me not, not talk around the bush, okay? Please. Get involved with God's health message. If you're new in the Adventist church, old in the Adventist church, we, our lifestyle as God's remnant is the health message. In the Day of Atonement, they were fasting. We can't fast from 1844, but our lifestyle tells us that we are fasting. Our simple lifestyle. And the way we conduct ourselves towards others. Because that's a true fast. The, 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 the medical missionary chapter in the Bible is Isaiah 58. Read Isaiah 58. With, first ourselves have a simple lifestyle. That we are fully consecrated to God. And how we treat others makes all the difference. That's our lifestyle. We, we are fully consecrated to God. We search our souls because we want our defects of character to be changed. To be changed. We want to be sealed. And of course we keep it as a Sabbath day. That means we're living in a holy time. We are fully consecrated to God. Right, it's typical of the Day of Judgment, which started in 1844, and the final cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. Those who did not search their souls and confessed were cut off from probation. Uh, probation was then closed. They were cut off. Very serious. Right, there was no more time after this. After the sanctuary was cleansed, the scapegoat was then taken into the wilderness, uh, typified the binding of Satan for the thousand years. Right, the scapegoat. Three sacrifices were offered, the bull, the ram, and the goat. So that was the investigative judgment, which we find in Daniel, a book of Acts and Romans. The judgment was set and the books were opened. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man ca came to the clouds of heaven to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near him. Jesus started the investigative judgment. Paul also spoke, spoke about that. He says, because he has appointed a day in which, in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, where he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. Last verse here, in the day when God shall judge the, the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So the judgment is and subject it is important in scripture and it was given to us even in a time prophecy which I do in the next lecture and in Revelation 11 18 Luke 12 verse 36 and the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple the ark of the testament that if the heavens are opened the temple is open in heaven we see the ark of the testament where are we in the most holy place that's where we are so when this is opened in the book of Revelation, we find ourselves in the most holy place. And you yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open unto him immediately. Now, this is in terms of the Jewish wedding. When he comes back to the wedding, right? He comes back to fetch his bride. There's a wedding taking place, and then there's a marriage supper taking place later. There's first the wedding, and then the marriage supper afterwards. Right, he's coming back on the wedding. The wedding time is the judgment time. You know that because there are parables that say, 
How did you get in here? Where's your wedding garment? It talks about the judgment. We need the wedding garment on because Jesus is finishing up the wedding between him and his bride. Right. If you don't have the garment on, you are not his bride. Simple as that. The marriage supper comes later. So this verse talks to our time. So the investigative judgment is in the most holy place. Now we come to the last feast. The tabernacles. Interesting feast. It was also called the feast of ingathering or the feast of booths. Held on the 15th day. Right up to the 22nd day of the month of Tishri. That means five days after the day of atonement. It happened for eight days. It was the most joyous feast of the year. It was the close of the fruit harvest and the corn harvest. So there was a barley harvest during the wave sheaf. Then there was the wheat harvest at Pentecost. And this is the fruit harvest at the end and the corn harvest. A golden vessel was filled with water from Siloam by the priest, mixed with wine, and poured on the sacrifice on the altar that day. You remember that story when Jesus didn't want to go to the Feast of Tabernacles. He says, I'm not going. He stayed behind. But when the Feast of Tabernacles, he appeared. And he says, I'm the water of life. That was the Feast of Tabernacles. The Israelites stayed in booths made by palm branches. Commemorative of their wilderness sojourn, right? Thinking back of how they traveled through the 40 years in the wilderness. Typical of the final ingathering of souls and the renewal of all things and the river of life. That is what the face of tabernacles symbolize. So in the earth made new, listen very carefully. In the earth made new, the seer of Israel observed. It shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations shall even go up from year to year to worship the king and keep the feast of tabernacles. So there's a prophecy not given by any other feast. Only the feast of tabernacles are going to be kept in the new heaven and new earth. I'll speak about it just now. The first and last day was the Sabbath days. There were eight sacrifices offered during these days. Zechariah talks about it, Revelation, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and keep the feast of tabernacles. Then in Revelation 21, 3, at, in the new earth, new heaven and new earth, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. That's the Feast of Tabernacles that he's talking about. God is going to tabernacle with his people. So, as we go along, the Passover is the cross. Then we come to the Pentecost, which is, well, the other feasts as well. Pentecost is the ascension. Investigative judgment. The trumpets that were blowing. And then there's the, the investigative judgment. Or the close of probation, when that is finished, then we have the second coming of Jesus, the starting of the tabernacle, Feast of Tabernacles, the thousand year period, that's when we have the Feast of Tabernacles, and afterwards, in the new heaven and new earth, and then we have the holy city, oh, I have the other slide, I'm thinking of another slide, but there are the feast days, so I ask you the question, is that prophetic? Is that prophetic? Does that tell us the movements of Jesus in salvation? Very clear. All the feast days were telling us how Jesus would come in the beginning to this earth the first time. And then what's going to happen when Jesus comes the second time. Gives us the main things that will happen. Alright? So we have those points of prophecy. What about the sabbatical year? What happened during the sabbatical year? The sabbatical year commenced after the harvest of the sixth year. Had been, so when all the harvests were gathered in, right, then they were announcing the next year as the year of release. Okay. It was probably announced on the Feast of Tabernacles of the previous year. 
So the land was to rest for the seventh year. Whatever grew by itself in the fields could be enjoyed by anyone during this year. If they did not obey, God will allow them to be captured by the enemies and the land can rest. Can you remember that? So for how many years did God rest the land then when they didn't do this? 70 years. Remember the 70 years of captivity? Babylonian captivity? Now that is an interesting study. If I have the chance, I will do that study with you. I have it on PowerPoints, but I didn't plan it to do it here. The 70 years of captivity is because they did not follow this principle that God gave them. This is a prophetic principle. They did not understood it. All right? They didn't do it. God says, I'm going to let the land rest. It was called the seventh year, the year of release, um, the year of rest unto the Lord, different terms used in Scripture. It gave opportunity for debts to be canceled and hired servants to a fellow Hebrew set free and the land had to rest for one year. So debts were canceled and if you were a servant to another Jew, you could be set free. But not if you were a servant to a heathen that was now part of the land. He came in as a Gentile into the land and acquired land in the land as well. Or took some of the land of the people. But this person coming into the land, he is abiding by the principles of the Jewish tradition. Are you with me? It's not just the heathen. Because they will never allow a heathen to come into the land and have a piece of land. Okay, So you could be a slave to a, another Hebrew or a slave to somebody that was not born as an Israelite. Okay. It gave opportunity for debts to be cancelled and, of course, uh, um, um, the slave to be set free. It was typical of the thousand years when we are released from debt and being slaves of sin and when this earth will rest for a thousand years. Okay, So you can understand that. Um, James White, Alan White, many others of our pioneers understood that we have 6,000 years and there's a, a thousand years which the land is going to rest. Revelation 26 tells us that, Blessed and holy is he that has part of the first resurrection, on such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. That's the, the seventh thousand year. One day is like a thousand years, Peter says to us, and in the book of Psalms. So that is what the, the pioneers used in Scripture. To, to prove this point. What about the Jubilee? Was announced with the trumpets on the day of, with trumpets on the day of atonement in the 49th year. Because the next year, the 50th year, will be the year of Jubilee. The purposes of Jubilee might be summed up with the following. It's rest, release, return, redemption. All of these words are used when Jubilee is used in the Bible. Israelites who became slaves to foreigners or strangers were set free. Debts were cancelled and that foreigner had to give back his land to the original Jew as well. Okay? And the final Jubilee will be ce ce celebrated after the millennium in the new heavens and new earth where we will be free from the servitude of Satan and enjoy the land given back to us. Acts 3 verse 20 to 21, in the Bible, different places using different words for the jubilee, is Paul uses the word, the times of restitution of all things. That means the new heaven and new earth, when everything is renewed. Other places of scripture, Paul uses the phrase, the purchase possession, or uses the phrase, the reward of the inheritance, or uses the phrase, eternal inheritance, or the inheritance incorruptible. That all takes us back to giving back our land when the, in the new heaven and the new earth. All right, that's the jubilee. So we have the cross, we have the ascension, the investigative judgment, the close of probation. And uh, after the close of probation, there's the seven last plagues. You remember that? There's a short period of seven last plagues. Second coming, the sabbatical year, uh, that's the thousand years. And then the Jubilee when everything is restored. That is prophetic. We follow Jesus by faith. The thousand years. 
and then the holy city descends. A few comments. Right. A few comments on Kingsman Redeemer. Right. When an Israelite fell into debt and he loses his land, they could ask a nearest family member if they had enough money to come and buy them back before the year of Jubilee. So he can buy the land back. Where do we have examples of that? The book of Ruth. Boaz. Remember that? And Jeremiah. Jeremiah was thrown in the prison. Right? For his prophesying. So his nephew comes to him and says, Uncle, you are the one that can buy our land back. Right? And it was recorded in a, a scroll. Yeah. I, I want to just make a comment on this. When... When a kingsman redeemer came, I want you to listen to my words. When, when you want your land back, okay, they called the elders. 24 elders. They called the elders and witnesses to witness the event. So outside, right, usually at the city gate, they would have the elders and the witnesses, like with Boaz and Ruth to talk about this transaction, to make sure everything's in place and there's witnesses. And everything was written in a, a book or a scroll and sealed. Does that ring a bell? Book of Revelation? Book of Revelation? Revelation. Right. But if we come to the book of Revelation, that scroll that was handed to Jesus, all right, what was in that scroll? If you think of this story, You'll find the answers. Right. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it later in the book of Revelation. Right. So that was the idea of the kings and the demon. What about the cities of refuge? Let me talk about that quickly. Because many people don't study these things. They don't know what it means. So the cities of refuge, when they had the land all allocated in Canaan to everybody, the Levites were in the towns and the cities and the priests as well. Everybody had their piece of land. God instructed them to build three cities of refuge on the eastern side of the Jordan, and three on the western side of the Jordan. And these cities of refuge, refuge was usually in a lower place, so that the last part of the journey is not uphill. Because if somebody accidentally killed a brother, he needed to run. He had a donkey or a horse, a bit faster, but he had to get to the city of refuge as soon as possible. Because if the family member gets him, it's over and done. Okay? The avenger of blood, right? The avenger of blood gets him. It's over and done with him. So if he gets to the city of refuge, right, then the elders would sit, and with the priests and the high priest, the, the judgment will sit, if you want to put it that way. And what happens? If he's innocent, he has to stay there, in that city, until the death of the high priest. Okay? Listen very carefully. But if he's not innocent, he was handed over to the avenger of blood. The next of the king family member. Or if he's innocent and he puts his foot out of the gates. And that family member sees him and grabs him. That's his problem. He went out of the city. Are you with me? And he could be killed by the family member, the avenger of blood. So let me ask a series of questions. See if you know your Bible. Who's the city of refuge? Christ. Okay? Run to Christ. Who's the avenger of blood? <laughs> it's Christ. Very clear in scripture. I thought the same as you. I thought the same as you. I've got the verses on you if you want them. The avenger of blood is the nearest family member. That will execute judgment because innocent blood was slain. Remember the martyrs in Revelation chapter 6 under the altar? They're crying out to the avenger of blood. They're not crying out to Satan. They're crying out to the avenger of blood. To avenge their blood in the judgment. Alright, let me see if you understand now. Now, okay, we, 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 we're in a roll here. Alright, the city is... Pointing to Jesus. The avenger of blood, the nearest family member, is Jesus. Who's the high priest in that city? It's Jesus. But 
but he has to wait in that city until the death of the high priest. Is Jesus going to die? So what does that mean? Until the close of probation. Because then the work of the high priest is done. He is not a high priest anymore. Now he comes as king of kings. Right. So where do we need to stay? Until when do we need to stay in that city? Until everything is done. Don't move out of that city. Don't move out of Christ. Does it make sense? That is very important. So everything in this whole story, in the cities of refuge, is pointing to, to Christ. The death of a person is very sacred to God. God was very serious to Israelites when innocent blood was shed. And that is why God is so serious that His children had to go through persecution. Because innocent blood was shed through all the years, through all the persecution from Adam until the last day. God is very serious about innocent blood being shed. And He's going to avenge our blood. That blood is crying out like Abel's blood to God in heaven. Right, city of refuge. That's what I tried to explain. Um, there's a verse in Numbers 35 verse 33 where this is used. That tells us that everything in this story is about Jesus. Everything in that story is about Jesus. I'm not going to take time of it. You can read it. Cities of refuge. Right. Now, it's interesting enough, there's, there's another story connected to, to these cities when innocent blood was shed. Okay? But it's a very interesting story. It's not connected really to the sanctuary. But if somebody was walking in the field and they find somebody dead in the field, they don't know who committed the crime. All right? God is so serious about that. Who committed that crime? who spilled innocent blood, that the people, that person has to go to the nearest city, and all the elders, the priests, the Levites, had to come out, and they had to go through a ritual, also with an heifer, not the red heifer, okay, with the heifer. So this heifer did not point necessarily to Jesus. But what needed to be done is this heifer, his neck was broken. There was no blood shed. The neck was broken. God was so serious about innocent blood that the, the, the Levites and the judges, they come there, they do this ritual to say, we are innocent of this. We didn't know this was happening. And that made an awareness within Israel that innocent blood has been shed. And everybody is now looking out for the guilty party and he will be brought to trial. That was the, the I, I just wanted to mention that. If you ever read it in the Bible, it's got to do with the heifer, but it doesn't point to Christ. It depends on there is another person that needs to die because if you take blood, another person needs to die. All right. So there is a connection with the death of Jesus, but not atonement. Not atonement. Right. And then we have the laws of Israel, part of the whole Jewish economy. is the moral laws. That's God's commandments, Ten Commandments, the ceremonial laws, the civil laws. And the hygiene laws. All of these four laws. Only one of those laws predicts, is prophetic, that Jesus would come. And that's the ceremonial laws. The ones I've done with you up to this point. The others don't change. The others don't change. Right. The law is a revelation of God's will. It's a law of the transcript of God's character. It's an expression of love. It's the words of God's covenant. Is the law of governance and liberty. That's God's law. So the moral law is called the law of liberty. Was spoken by God. Written by his own finger. Placed inside the ark. Was complete and perfect. It was holy and good. Points out sin. Stands forever. And is a spiritual delight. But what about the ceremonial law? The ceremonial law is, called, is contained in ordinances. Written by Moses. Right? Not by God. It was placed outside of the ark. Right. It was added to, for them to understand. Okay. The plan of salvation. It was nailed to the cross. It points to the Savior. Right. Till the seed comes. 
was abolished by Christ, and it was carnal, and it was a burden placed on the Israelites. Can you see the difference between the moral law and the ceremonial law? All right. God's law has not been taken away, but the ceremonial law. It was all shadows to come. Everything we did with you in these lectures is a shadow to come. All right. So then people are asking me. That's my last comment that I have. Um, just reading you the text first. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. Right. Tells us the ceremonial system is finished. He, the spotless Lamb of God, was about to present himself as a sin offering, that he would thus bring to an end the system of types and ceremonies that for a thousand years, four thousand years, had pointed to his death. So Christ's death and resurrection completed his covenant before this time it was revealed through types and shadows. Christ's sacrifice is the glorious fulfillment of the whole Jewish economy. The whole ceremonial system was made up of symbols pointing to Christ, to his sacrifice and his priesthood. Right, and he's talking about type and anti-type and Jesus met all those things. It all talks about that it's a shadow to come. And I just want to make a comment on it. Those are the last slides. I don't have to read it to you. You can read it. I just want to make the comment. There are seven Adventists that get into this idea that we still need to keep the feast days. All right? Now, I sometimes think they get the idea from the, from the, the Feast of Tabernacles. Because how many feasts have come to fulfillment? Six. If you followed me now, the Feast of Tabernacles is when Jesus will come and into the new heaven and new earth. So, should we keep the Feast of Tabernacles because it's not been fulfilled? All right. There's something very interesting that I want to bring to your attention. I thought of that for a long time because the Feast of Tabernacles is on the 15th day of the seventh month. So if the Feast of Tabernacles, if every single feast was happening on the date, even calculating by our first Adventist pioneers, the date of 22 October 1844, then we should be able to calculate when Jesus' second coming will happen. According to the Feast of Tabernacles. It was the 15th day of the seventh month. The same way they calculated the dates for the Day of Atonement, for the Passover, for all the other feasts, why not the Feast of Tabernacles? It uh, troubled me for a long time. Because you cannot put a date to the second coming of Jesus. So what now? Then I realized the Feast of Tabernacles is the last feast, okay, and is not connected. It was a celebration feast, meaning the harvest was already ingathered. Are you with me? The harvest was already gathered. So if we look at the first six feasts, those six feasts happened in the 2,300 year period. And the Spirit of Prophecy tells us that when 1844 arrived, according to Revelation 10, verse 6 and 7, it says there, the time is no longer. Time is no longer. What did it mean? Ellen White gives us the answer. She says, prophetic time came to an end. Prophetic time came to an end. That means all these feast days up to the Day of Atonement could be calculated according to time. But when the Day of Atonement came, that was the last feast day. That would calculate by time. So you cannot do that with the Feast of Tabernacles. So the Feast of Tabernacles, you cannot calculate by time. Because if that's the case, you can calculate the second coming of Jesus. So the Feast of Tabernacles, which we're going to keep in the new heaven and new earth, is going to be a reminder of our life here on earth. Our travels here on earth. 
Not that we're going to rem remember all the sins and all this nonsense here. But it's a joyous occasion because everything is finished. And God has made everything new. And we are there by the river of life. Jesus took, or the priest took those, the bowl mixed with the blood and the water on the day of tabernacles or the Feast of Tabernacles, went up to the temple and poured that into, in next to the, to the altar there and into the river Kishon. Was it Kidron? Sorry, Kidron. It's all symbols that we are going to be there in the new heaven and new earth and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, if we keep the Feast of Tabernacles, then what? Is it not somehow going to be fulfilled? Are you with me? It's in the fact that we are there in the new heaven and new earth. We are keeping them as a celebration, reminding us that sin will never again come up again. God has done everything for us and we will rejoice in heaven for that great salvation that God has made for us. And that is prophetic. God has given that to us. May God bless you. We're going to talk about now Daniel Revelation from the sanctuary point of view. Let us have a word of prayer. Father, thank you. For leading us through the feast days to see the times you have appointed. Showing us when things are going to happen. And that we will follow you by faith and know what is our duties in this time. And we're looking forward to the Feast of Tabernacles. When everything is over and you will come to fetch us. Is my prayer in Jesus name. Amen.